Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's lecture we are going to be looking at the formation and differentiation of the Earth. Alright, let's get going. So the Earth has managed to avoid being destroyed by an impact, pulled or pushed into the Sun, or just ejected altogether from our solar system. So, you know, by the end of the accretionary phase of planet growth, the Earth had done pretty well. But it got even better. We actually somehow managed to end up in the habitable zone. So we ended up with a, uh, we ended up in the zone within which liquid water can survive on a planet's surface. And to help that happen, we actually ended up with a planet that had a functioning greenhouse effect. So, my word, we've done pretty well for ourselves. So that's it. All over. Right. Done? Everyone go home? No. So, when we think of the Earth, we do, of course, think of this. However, by the end of the accretionary phase, what we actually have is something like this. It is a sphere of magma. Okay, So, from the very centre of the Earth to the Earth's surface, it is nothing but silicate magma. So, everything is molten. I, should, I just want to make a quick point, by the way. I forgot to make it in the previous presentation, so I've left a note for myself here. In order for a body to become a sphere... <clears throat> it needs to achieve a minimum diameter of 320 kilometers. So this is the diameter within which the internal heat and the gravity of the body will be sufficient to allow it to take on a spherical form. Um, so if you think of most asteroids, most of them just look like potatoes because they never actually achieve sufficient diameter. Whereas if you think of the largest of the asteroids, uh, Cirrus, C-E-R-E-S, um, you'll see that it has actually taken on a spherical form because it has achieved sufficient diameter to allow the gravity and the internal heat to allow it to uh, take on that spherical form. So that was something I forgot to make in the previous presentation, so I'm just going to quickly make it now. So the question is, is how do we go from uh, essentially a sea of magma to a nicely differentiated Earth? Now you can see when it comes to differentiating the Earth, we can do it in one of a couple of ways. We can do it based on compositional characteristics or mechanical characteristics. So the mechanical characteristics are quite straightforward. Is the layer solid or is the layer liquid? In terms of compositional characteristics, the question is, what is the layer made of? So, you know, these layers are all chemically distinct from one another. Now these two types of uh, differentiation will obviously not align. As you can quite clearly see, the inner core and outer core are separate based on their mechanical properties, but they have the same chemical composition, so they are combined when you consider them as part of a compositional system. So, you know, just bear that in mind. I should also point out, by the way, that this diagram here is going to come up a few times, and it's also a diagram that does make a reasonable amount, you know, reasonable number of appearances in uh, midterms and occasionally in the final as well. So really make sure you know this diagram here and make sure you know each of these individual layers. Just going to give you that heads up now. Okay, so geologists separate the internal layers of the earth as they're using mechanical or compositional properties. So first of all, let's start thinking about the mechanical layering. As I said, the mechanical layering simply goes, is the layer solid or is the layer liquid? So let's think of the lithosphere and the asphenosphere. They're considered different layers. So data indicates that both the continental and oceanic crust are not detached from the mantle. They are in fact actually attached to a thin layer of, ma of solid mantle rocks that are stuck onto the bottom of them. So from a purely mechanical point of view, we have a solid continental crust, a solid con uh, oceanic crust, and a solid layer of uh, mantle rock stuck onto the bottom of both of them. So what we've decided to do is we've taken that package and we've combined it all together and we've simply called it the lithosphere. It doesn't matter that they all have different compositions, the continental crust and the oceanic crust and ma those mantle rocks, all completely different. But from a point of view of their mechanical properties, they're all solid. So geologists lump them all together and call them the lithosphere. I should also point out, by the way, that this contact between the continental and oceanic crust and this thin layer of solid mantle rock stuck to the bottom of them is of course called the moho. It's a term you've probably come across before. Now underneath the lithosphere we have the asphenosphere. So the asphenosphere is made up of iron magnesium silicates 
and the transition from the lithosphere to the asphenosphere is obviously defined by a change in mechanical properties. So the lithosphere, so the, the asphenosphere, I do apologise, is mechanically weak, so it will flow, it will undergo ductile deformation. So modelling suggests that the asphenosphere is a mixture of solid material and a small volume of melt, also referred to as magma. So you need to think of it something like a slushy. So a slushy is mostly ice, but in between the ice crystals you obviously have the, you know, the, your syrup of choice. So this melt appears to be constrained to the upper, well concentrated should I say, to the upper 100 kilometres of the asphenosphere. So the asphenosphere is approximately 700 kilometres thick. It looks like the upper 100 kilometres of it is quite magma rich and, and quite solid poor, whereas the lower 600 kilometres is more solid rich and more magma poor. Now, this is important because it means because the upper layer of the asphenosphere is more liquid, it gives essentially a layer on which the lithosphere can float and move. And of course, if you think about it, that's obviously extremely important when it comes to plate tectonics. So the combination of the little bit of mantle rock stuck onto the bottom of the lithosphere and the asphenosphere is also sometimes referred to as the upper mantle. So I've just thrown a whole load of terms at you. So let's just try it one more time. The oceanic crust and continental crust, they are chemically different, but they are both solid. And attached to the bottom of both of them, we have a small piece of mantle rock. And so a small layer of mantle rock, should I say. So the oceanic crust, the continental crust, and that small bit of mantle rock are lumped together as a lithosphere. Underneath the lithosphere, there is a semi-liquid layer on which the lithosphere floats, and that is the asphenosphere. Now, because the asphenosphere and that little bit of mantle rock stuck onto the bottom of the oceanic and continental crust have the same composition, it means they are sometimes referred to as a unit, and that unit is sometimes referred to as the upper mantle. So, you know, I hope that made things clear. So, the asphenosphere's lower boundary is about 700 kilometres down. And below the asphenosphere, we have the mesosphere, also referred to as the lower mantle. Now, the mesosphere is solid, and it's made up of uh, magnesium iron uh, silicates. So, as we move our way through the mesosphere, we eventually end up in the outer core and the inner core. Now, the outer core and inner core aren't made of silicates. They're made of it's an iron-nickel alloy, so it's going to have different properties in terms of melting. So, the outer portion of the core is liquid and the inner portion is solid. So from a mechanical point of view they are considered uh, distinct and so they are classified as the outer core and the inner core. In terms of compositional layering it's purely based on the chemistry. It doesn't matter what the physical properties of the layer are, we're exclusively interested in what they're made of. So the core consists of any material, or should I say contains, any material which is dominated by iron-nickel alloy. So that's obviously going to include the inner core and the outer core. In terms of the mantle, well the mantle uh, contains any material which is dominated by iron-magnesium silicates. So that's going to include the mesosphere, the asphenosphere, and that thin little bit of mantle rock stuck to the bottom of the continental and oceanic crust. In terms of the continental crust, well, that's dominated by sodium, potassium, calcium, aluminum silicates, whilst the oceanic crust is dominated by calcium iron silicates. So you can see that each of the four units has a very, very distinct chemistry, and based on what your rock is made of, it will fall into one of those four groupings. Should I say what your layer is made of, it will fall into one of those four groupings. So, obviously, we need to say, right, well, okay, I've just told you that the internal structure of the Earth is layered. The question is, is how do we actually know? So, let's think about this. So, our problem is, is we can't obviously take samples of rocks from inside the Earth, can we? So, how do we try and work out what's going on? Well, there, there was an attempt to see what would happen the, the deeper you drilled into the crust. It took place in Russia, in the Kola Peninsula, and it's called the uh, Kola Super Deep Borehole. 
and that reached uh, 12,262 meters in depth. And now the problem is that was drilling through continental crust. So 12,000 meters is not going to be sufficient to actually get you through the continental crust and into the mantle rocks attached to the bottom of it. So valiant attempt, but unfortunately didn't really work. They did get some very interesting data. And unfortunately, the hole couldn't actually go any deeper because at about 12,000 meters, as soon as you drill the hole and remove the rock, the hole instantly closes again. So you can't actually really drill past about 12,000 meters. You just you know, can't really go any further. Now, there are currently plans to uh, take a ship and drill in the Atlantis Bank area here in the Indian Ocean. Now, this is a really good target because this is oceanic crust and it happens to be a really nice thin bit of oceanic crust. And so if we were to take a, well, if we take a, a ship there and we drill straight through that thin piece of oceanic crust, we will actually pass quite quickly into the underlying mantle rocks. And so by doing this, we'll be able to collect direct samples of the upper mantle. So this is one of the ways that we could you know, manage to get an idea of what's going on. We haven't done it yet, though, so we don't have those samples. So how do we actually know what the mechanical properties of the Earth's interior are? Well, what we need is something that can travel deep into the Earth and you know, allow us to image what's going on. And it just so happens that we have the thing, seismic waves. So what we need to do is we need to break out the geophysicists, or more accurately, the seismologists, and put them to work. So when there's a large earthquake or a very large explosion, like a nuclear explosion, uh, it creates a large amount of seismic waves. Now, these seismic waves are obviously d detected by seismometers all over the globe. And we typically use those seismic waves to identify the earthquake's location, its depth, and its intensity. However, big earthquakes or very big explosions can produce waves that can travel from one side of the Earth to the other. And the path and speed at which those uh, waves arrive or don't arrive is actually helpful to us in trying to image what is happening in the Earth's interior. So an earthquake will produce four types of waves. Raleigh waves, love waves, P waves, and S waves. Now, uh, Raleigh waves and love waves are both surface waves. That means they move across the surface of the Earth. Now, that means those are the ones that are actually damaging during an earthquake. Those are the ones that make your building go up and down and shake from side to side. So those are the ones that actually damage your accommodation You know, if, you, um, if you're in an earthquake. P waves and S waves are body waves, so they actually move through the Earth's interior. P wave stands for primary wave, S wave stands for secondary wave. So these are the ones that obviously we're going to use to try and work out what's happening in the interior of the Earth. Okay, P waves, S waves. So a P wave is a compositional wave. Okay, sorry, compression, compositional, compressional wave. So you can see that as the wave passes through, it pushes the atoms closer together, and then as the wave continues, those atoms are then allowed to relax and spread back to their original position. Now, because it's a compressional wave, it means it's very, very fast, but it also means that it can travel through both solids liquids, and even in extreme cases, gases. So if you think about it, you know, even though a liquid doesn't have this kind of rigid structure like a solid, the atoms or molecules within that liquid can still be moved by a compressional wave. So if you think about it, if a compressional wave goes into water, one water molecule gets pushed towards another water molecule, while the repulsion between those two water molecules will push the second water molecule away, that will push it towards a third water molecule, that third water molecule will then repel a fourth water molecule, and so on. So the wave, although moving more slowly, is still moving through the liquid. So P waves are very, very helpful because they will travel through both solids and liquids. Remember, we've already said the Earth is mechanically uh, split up into solid and liquid layers, so that's going to be helpful to us. Now, S waves, on the other hand, are shear waves. So they are going to make essentially your atoms move in a sinusoidal pattern. 
So as you can see, that's very easily achieved if you have a solid coherent layer. Okay, so imagine you, you know, you tie a piece of string to a wall, you, you know, you walk the end of the piece of string and you start shaking that piece of string up and down, you'll see the waves go along that piece of string and you'll be able to do that because the piece of string is one solid layer. Now, the, of course, the second a, another person walks into the room, sees you doing that, grabs a pair of scissors and cuts the piece of string in half, well, all of a sudden, the, 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 the energy that you're pat the wave you're trying to pass down that piece of string it won't transmit anymore will it because there's a break so shear waves require a consistent material to move through they require something to have a essentially a rigid lattice like a solid rock or solid mineral okay so s waves can only move through solid material the second they hit a liquid well, it just doesn't work for them. They, they can't make the molecules do what's required. And so as soon as an S wave hits a liquid, that's it. Game over. So we have these two different types of waves. Essentially, P waves are faster than S waves. And P waves can travel through solids and liquids. S waves can only travel through solids. So these are going to be very, very helpful characteristics when we try and image the interior of the Earth. Okay, so to begin with, what do geologists actually see when we look at how P and S waves move through the Earth? Well, the first thing we can see is these are the two paths, or should I say the two velocities, that we see as these waves pass through the Earth. Now, the first thing you'll notice is we have S waves over here in purple and P waves over here in brown. Now, you'll notice that we have a velocity of 0 kilometers a second here and 14 kilometers a second over here. Okay, so what you'll notice is, is let's just look at the, well, let's look at P waves to start with. So P waves, as you come down through the crust, step into the this solid bit of upper mantle, then step into the asphenosphere, it kind of gets a little bit confusing around the asphenosphere. Then as you hit the mesosphere proper, the P wave velocity begins to increase quite rapidly. Now it's increasing because as you go down through the mesosphere, the rocks are getting denser and denser and denser. That means the atoms are packed tighter and tighter and tighter. And so the P wave can move through it, move through them more efficiently. So it begins to pick up speed. And so as the P wave moves through the mesosphere, it begins to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. Then all of a sudden it hits the outer core and the velocity drops quickly. OK, but you'll notice the P wave does not stop, though. It continues to move through the outer core, continuing to pick up more velocity again. So it means it's essentially hit a liquid layer here. So the velocity is dropped. So this is telling us this outer core is liquid. And then as it's moving through the outer core, what you'll notice is the, the velocity is increasing. This is telling us as we move through the outer core, the amount of solid material is getting higher and higher and higher. And then we have another jump in velocity as we hit the inner core, which is telling us once again we've gone from a solid to a liquid, uh, sorry, liquid to a solid. And then the velocity, as you can see, stays pretty much constant. So this profile is essentially telling us that we have a more or less solid sequence of layers here. Now, obviously, don't forget the upper layer of the asphenosphere is a kind of liquid solid mush. So, you know, just bear that in mind. So it's not 100% solid, but nevertheless, we have the uh, solid-ish upper portion. Then as we hit the outer core, the velocity drops, but it doesn't go to zero. The, the wave is still moving. It moves through the liquid outer core and then into the solid inner core. Now, in contrast, when we look at the velocity of S waves, what happens? Well, as you can see, we come down through the crust. We go into the... Oh, sorry about that. We go into the... Uh, lower cross so we go into the lithosphere sphenosphere transition as you can see the velocity drops quite velocity stays stable there because it's going into this kind of liquid slushy mush so it, it doesn't disappear completely but the velocity doesn't really do very much then the velocity begins to increase as we're going down through the mantle remember these uh, these deeper um, uh, mesosphere rocks are denser and denser and denser so they have you know the s waves being transmitted faster and faster and faster and then all of a sudden as soon as it hits the mesosphere outer core boundary drops to zero and so that's clearly telling us that what we have here is we have a liquid boundary
Okay, so we're going to into a liquid outer core. And that's sent the S wave straight down to zero. And so obviously no S waves can pass through the uh, outer core. However, sometimes when a P wave transitions from the outer core into the inner core, it can actually generate S waves. So we do sometimes see S waves uh, moving through the Earth's inner core as well. And uh, geophysicists are smart enough to be able to actually you know, detect these S waves. OK, so this is what we see in terms of velocity. So we can see straight away the outer core has to be liquid because we can see the, the S wave dropping to zero and the P wave losing a significant amount of its velocity. So the next question is, is well, why do we have these uh, different layers in the Earth's interior? So if we look at these two graphs, we have a temperature graph on the left and a pressure graph on the right. And so what's this, what, what these graphs are showing us is it's showing us the increase and in temperature and pressure as you go down into the Earth. So obviously we have the Earth's surface here and the Earth's core here, the Earth's center, should I say, here. Same here, surface of the Earth here, center of the Earth here. So, okay. So what can we see is happening? Well, you'll notice that if we look at temperature, the thing that happens is, is we have this very, very rapid increase in temperature right at the top. In contrast, the increase in pressure is very, very gradual. So this means that the rocks in the upper portion of the Earth's mantle are being heated up. So essentially the temperature is going up really, really fast. So they're very, very hot, but the pressure is quite low. Now, one of the things that can stop a rock melting is pressure. Typically, the higher the pressure, the more difficult it is for a rock to melt. The reason is, is the higher the pressure, the more the atoms are being squished together and held in place. And of course, a liquid needs bonds between atoms to break so the atoms can move independently of one another. So if the pressure is so great that it stops those atoms being able to move independently of one another, well, that means your material cannot melt. In this instance, though, what's happening is the temperature is coming up very, very quickly. The pressure is only rising slowly. And so what we see is when we move from the bottom of the lithosphere into the upper mantle, we see all of a sudden that the upper mantle rocks reach a temperature at which they begin to melt and the pressure is not able to stop it. And so this is where we see the asphenosphere forming. Okay, so the asphenosphere, most of, most of the liquid portion of the asphenosphere is going to be about here. Okay, and then from this point down to about here, we have the more solid part of the asphenosphere. So this explains why we have this transition from solid material up here, where the temperature isn't high enough to melt the continental or oceanic crust. And then as we move straight into the upper mantle, the temperature goes flying up. Pressure can't compensate for it, and so we get these upper mantle rocks melting. That gives us the asphenosphere. And then by the time we are into the lower mantle, well, yes, the temperature is increasing, but the temperature increase is much slower. But the rate of increase in pressure has started to really pick up now. So as you move into the lower mantle, the pressure is high enough to stop any melting. And that continues until we make it all the way down here to the uh, lower mantle outer core boundary. And at this point, as you can see, pressure is extremely high. But temperature is once and also temperature isn't actually increasing that quickly. However, the outer core is made of a completely new material. It's no longer silicate minerals, it's made of iron nickel alloy. So it's going to behave slightly differently. So even though the pressure is very, very high, the temperature at this depth is sufficient to allow that material to melt. And so it does. So we have a liquid outer core. And then by the time you make it into the inner core, the pressure is just so stupidly high that the, uh, the, 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 the iron nickel alloy will solidify and form a solid inner core. So essentially we go from solid crust, liquid asphenosphere, solid lower mantle, liquid outer core, solid inner core. And it's just a, essentially a, a balancing act between temperature and pressure and what the layer is made of. So 
In order to stop rocks from melting, minerals will very often undergo what's referred to as a phase change. So a lot of the time when a rock finds itself, or should I say when a mineral finds itself in conditions that it doesn't like, it won't melt, it will simply change into a new mineral. So this gets around the whole melting problem. So um, most minerals cannot survive the extreme temperatures and pressures that you know will be experienced in the Earth's interior. So they're forced to recrystallize to a new form which is stable under those conditions. Normally when you form that new mineral, because it's forming under higher pressure conditions, the atoms of the new mineral will very often be uh, packed more closely together. And this obviously causes these new minerals to be a lot more dense. And obviously this increase in density is what we saw earlier when we saw the seismic velocities increasing. Remember, the denser the rock, the faster the P waves and S waves can move through it. So what we're seeing here is the rocks becoming denser and denser and denser, and we see that reflected in the increase in the P wave velocity. So just to give you some idea of how these phase changes actually work, we're going to look at the classic uh, situation, and this is for the mineral olivine. Now, olivine is an extremely common mineral in the upper mantle. It, you know, you, you can't really move for olivine-rich rocks in the upper mantle. They're everywhere. So <clears throat> olivine is perfectly happy in this upper mantle portion. So this red line here is marking around 410 kilometers. So above this line here, olivine is perfectly happy. So that's the upper mantle. So that's the piece of rock that's stuck to the bottom of the continental crust and oceanic crust and it also covers the asphenosphere well should I say at least a good part of the asphenosphere now after about 410 kilometers however olivine just can't take it anymore the temperature and pressure are too high and so what olivine has to do is it has to change into the mineral wesleyite same chemical formula by the way but you'll notice the density has increased because those atoms are being packed more tightly. Now as the temp as you go deeper and deeper the pressure and temperature obviously increases further and at 520 kilometers Wesleyite can't take it anymore and it will change into Ringwoodite. Once again same chemical formula but you'll notice the density has increased. And then finally as you increase the pressure and temperature, so you go deeper at around 660 kilometers, this is around the um, lower asphenosphere uh, mesosphere boundary. The ringwoodite, once again, just can't take it, and then that will transition into silicate perovskite. Different chemical formula this time, and you'll notice the density, once again, has increased. And so what you can see is you can see how the increase in pressure and temperature is driving the change in these minerals and as they as they as it transitions from one mineral to another the you have the uh, associated increase in density being caused because they are forming in a higher pressure environment each time and obviously we see that reflected in the increasing p waves and s wave velocities so okay so now let's go all the way back to our P waves and S waves. So what are they going to do? You know, what are they going to show us? Okay, so what we're going to imagine is we're going to imagine that something happens at the North Pole. Okay, let's just say it's a huge earthquake on the seafloor at the North Pole. And that's going to send P waves and S waves flying down into the Earth. Okay, so we're going to start with the S waves first. Well, any S wave that forms here and it takes that path, it's going to be fine because remember, it's moving through the solid crust, the semi solid asphenosphere, and the solid mantle. So, it's any path along there is fine. The path along here, absolutely fine. So, any seismic station in this region will be able to pick up S waves produced by this earthquake. Once again, same with any seismic station in this region, they will also pick up those S waves. However, as soon as an S wave comes down here and it hits the outer core boundary, well, that's a solid to liquid transition, and that's it. The S waves cannot go through. And so from 110 degrees, either way, from the uh, epicenter of your earthquake, you will be unable to receive S waves. And this, of course, tells us two things. Number one, it tells us the outer core is liquid. 
but it also allows us to calculate the diameter of the outer core. Okay, so now let's look at P waves. Well, once again, P waves uh, have the same general situation going on. As you'll notice that here's our earthquake once again, here are our P waves, anywhere from the earthquake epicenter itself all the way around to 110 degrees, the P waves will just simply pass through the crust, pass through the asphenosphere, pass through the mantle. With minimum effort, they'll just have they'll follow an arced course and they'll appear at the seismic stations where you expect them to, to where you expect them to and when you expect them to. Okay, because the path they're taking is pretty much what you would expect. The same goes for the waves that pass through the outer core. Now you'll notice that they're passing through the mantle, everything's going well. Now then, then they hit the mantle outer core transition here. Now at this point we're going to have refraction. The wave isn't going to continue along the path it was taking. Because it's moving from a fast medium, the rock, into a slow medium, the liquid, angle at which the wave is moving will change okay so you can see if it was just solid rock the wave would come down here and then it would just continue and it would probably appear somewhere over here but because the wave comes down here and then hits or go, tries to go across this boundary all of a sudden the wave steepens and it takes this path and then it will shallow as it passes back into the solid here and it will take this path so because of this it means you have this shadow zone for P waves between 110 and 140 degrees. However, that's the only P wave shadow you have in contrast to the shadow for the S waves, which is essentially massive there between 110 and 110. Now, in terms of waves that pass through the center of the, well, the, in a core, should I say? Well, this is one of the interesting things. So it didn't take long to work out the mantle was solid. It didn't take long to work out that the outer core was liquid. However, one of the interesting things that happened was is we were having earthquakes here, and obviously we would be waiting to detect them over here. And so we would know how long it would take, right? We would know the wave would be passing through, it would go so fast through the mantle, it would go so fast through the liquid core, it would go so fast through the mantle again, and we would expect you know, to know when and where we would you know be detecting a wave okay so we would know right the wave should appear at this location about this time however when we uh, actually looked at the waves we found the waves were arriving early and in the wrong location so this was a little bit confusing and so when you you know put your mind to it the only obvious answer is that there has to be a solid portion inside the core and so this means your wave is passing through your mantle and it's increasing in speed sorry about that it's then uh, so your wave is passing through the mantle it's increasing in speed then it hits the liquid outer core changes angle slows down then it passes into the solid inner core changes angle again speeds up so this is where it's gain gaining the extra speed and also because it's changing its angle here, this is also going to change where it turns up. Then it moves back into the liquid outer core and then back into the solid mantle. And so the presence of this solid inner core is going to change the velocity of the wave. So it's going to arrive a little bit early. And the locations in which those waves are going to arrive and the timing in which they arrive is going to be affected. And so by combining those two bits of data together, you can calculate the size of the inner core. And so this is how we know we have these mechanical layers. We just simply use the P waves and the S waves. It's not really that difficult. Okay, so this is a good place to stop. So uh, once again, get up, have a walk around, get a glass of water, take 10 minutes and then come back for the next part of the presentation, please.